Just got switched over to the two gigahertz band and I actually have more bars now on my laptop, so I assume this is gonna go a little bit better. TP-Link sent over their EAP610 Outdoor for us to check out. Now this thing is particularly cool because it is IP67 rated, which is great for outdoor use, and it's Wi-Fi 6 capable. So if you have a large outdoor space that you want really good Wi-Fi coverage and speed on, this is probably the thing for you. But before we get into too many details, let's go ahead and get this thing unboxed so you at least know what it comes with and what to expect if you are to order one of your own. And as per usual, it looks like TP-Link has packaged these things well. So here is the bracket that goes on the rear. So you would screw this into like the wall or something. Uh, we have a power cord. This is for the PoE adapter. Uh, so this will give you passive power. So you put data here to your switch and then power over ethernet or PoE to the access point itself. Looks like we have some zip ties if you wanna mount this thing to a pole or some other uh, medium. We have some material here. This looks like this uh, protects the bottom of the access point itself uh, from water intrusion and the elements. So your ethernet adapter or ethernet cable will go through here. Uh, and then we have some mounting hardware. And then of course we have the EAP610 itself. So this is uh, what everyone's interested in. And then some manuals and other stuff we don't care about. We'll leave that in there. As tradition dictates, it's time to take this thing apart so we can get an idea of what's inside. This is important so we can see what the what kind of antennae or how many antennae it has. And we technically already know because it's listed on TP-Link's website but I wanna look anyway, because we've taken everything apart. Actually, before we take it apart, let's do a quick size comparison. That way, that way I don't forget to do that, because I will. So obviously the 610 Outdoor is very large. Here is the 610 Indoor, and just so everyone knows, you can use these indoors, although it is quite tall, as you can tell. This is a EAP670, and then of course, this is a Ubiquiti uh, U6LR. So as you can tell, pretty tall, uh, but, the big difference here, or the big thing here, is actually how <coughs> thick it is. So we're going to compare it against the EAP670 because this is also pretty thick. And even though the EAP670 has a large footprint, it actually manages to um, be unnoticeable, especially when it's up on the ceiling. I guess it depends on your ceilings, but yeah, pretty thick. They're almost about the same thickness. Almost. Now that out of that way, uh, let's go ahead and get that thing cracked open and see what's inside. I count four screws on the rear, and I believe um, potentially four screws on the, on the bottom here. So let's just start with these and see where we get. These are torqued down extremely well, so I had to get a bigger screwdriver so I could get more torque on it. I wish TP-Link would etch in all of the information like they do on this device on all of their other devices like the EAP660 and 670. Now they, they use a sticker typically that hides a screw on those and you have to damage that sticker in order to get to the screws underneath it. And I really dislike that. And I hope that they do this in the future and then just I'll have like a screw hole somewhere in the middle. That would be so cool to have. Get in here, it's gonna require some hand strength. Uh, there are two clips right here and here that are holding the entire shell. Uh, well, not the entire shell, but the back plate to the shell. And this is the inside. It is um, not a whole lot to look at. So we have a ginormous heat sink. And I'm guessing on this side here might be the CPU uh, potentially. It's really hard to see. I'd have to remove this to see what's under there, but we still need to test with this. Okay, it's not very easy to tell, but there's actually two different uh, sets of possibly chips. So I'm guessing one of these must be the compute and one must be something else. Uh, this could also be CPU down here. Again, without removing the heatsink, I'm not really able to tell, but it's very simple. There's really not much in here. I would remove the entire PCB, but I don't want to. Um, I think this is a good enough view. And what's really nice about this is we have the rubber seal that sits all along on the inside here. And then you can see that the screws go in 
uh, to each of these holes and then there's also rubber around there as well. That seems pretty well built. You don't have to worry about damaging the rubber seals, I don't believe, when taking it apart as long as you are careful when removing the back plate, which you should never have to do. Um, so that's nice. So here's a reset button, which is cool. Uh, there, you need a little tiny tool to uh, access this from the outside of the unit. Of course, you have your power over ethernet port. And then this is the grounding wire, um, I am guessing. I'm pretty sure it is. And uh, that's really there, all there is to see in here. Pretty simple device. Let's get it put back together and then we can go do some testing. Just finished getting this thing reassembled, making sure all the last screws are tightened down. And now I'm gonna go get this mounted or installed at the pool house. And I'm actually gonna under install it underneath the pavilion. Man, I cannot speak. Underneath the pavilion or roof, whatever you wanna call it. It's actually not gonna be exposed directly to the elements, but it'll still be outside nonetheless. Um, so I'm gonna go do that and then we'll take a look at some speed tests. BRB. At the pool house, I opted to mount the access point in the top right corner that you see there. And I went ahead and mounted it underneath the pavilion as much as possible because I thought that was safest and cleanest. Here is an extremely rough diagram of the pool area. And of course, this is not the scale. This is something I mocked together. And the access point is mounted in the top right corner of the pool house. I stood about 10 and then eventually 20, 50, 65, 75, and so forth feet away and did speed tests, five speed tests at each interval. Uh, and that is the results that you're about to see for each of those. Up first are the 2.4 gigahertz results. And when we got out to about 120 feet, I actually wasn't able to establish a connection or I had intermittent connection issues. And that thought that was really strange. So I checked Ray Owl's channel and he was able to corroborate the same thing. Um, although I'm not sure at what distance he was experiencing issues. Well, let's switch over to the 2.4. Okay, let's start preparing. That is not a good sign. 240, okay. For some reason we got better coverage on the five gigahertz channel. Here are the results for the five gigahertz band and we were able to get well beyond 120 feet surprisingly. I didn't mark the results for anything beyond 120 because I just didn't think they were worthwhile. But as you can see, the it performed really well even at these distances. Of course we used iPerf 3 to do all of the speed testing and on our client side, this is a Wi-Fi 6E capable laptop. So there should be no bottlenecks on the client. And this is only a Wi-Fi 6 capable access point, of course. So any limitations should be on this device specifically. Now, as far as the other network hardware in the loop, we of course use a 10 gigabit switch, thus eliminating any other possible network bottlenecks that we may encounter. I could have used a 2.5 gigabit switch, but I chose not to. And I also could have used a one gigabit switch, again, choosing not to in favor of using a 10 gig switch. So that way we just really didn't have any potential bottlenecks as I mentioned earlier. And so I believe that concludes this video. I really don't know what else there is to share with you. And uh, I wanna thank you all for watching. Thank you TP-Link for sending over the EAP610 outdoor so we could check that out. And I will see all of you next time. Peace.